So we are meeting community relations meeting today, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Walston uh, and we'll run through the agenda. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we have a light agenda uh, with two items. However, it's heavy and its importance and potential impact on the district. Uh, the first one is um, about uh, collective impact. This is something uh, we have talked about a little bit in the district in my short time here. Um, Anne has been working really hard behind the scenes trying to drum up interest and more importantly, financial support uh, for this endeavor. Uh, some of our neighbors have a collective impact which she's going to speak to um, and, and talk about the potential benefits of um, forming one here in Danbury. And Anne has an update for us and Anne's gonna start us off. Good afternoon, everybody on this gray, gray, dreary day. So um, I have been part of many different collective impacts in Danbury over the years that has not gone very far. And what do I mean by collective impact? So collective impact is where you take all your different community agencies that touch our families, touch our children, touch our education system and bring them together assess what are the needs of the community are and set goals that will um, have all the agencies work together to help meet those goals of your students. So for instance, uh, Bridgeport has what they call Bridgeport Prospers, Waterbury Bridges. And the one that I'm really uh, have been following is the Norwalk Acts. And so this past summer, uh, due to some of their ESSER money and to do, to do with 13 years of collective impact down there, they were able to give pretty much 99% of their students a six week summer learning experience. 124 of their agencies came together and said, this is what we can do. This is where our um, strengths lie. And this is how we can meet the needs of your students to have a summer experience. Wouldn't it be great to have something like that in Danbury where every student had a summer experience that um, uh, remedies any learning needs, that boosters or boosts their education, things like that. Um, back two and a half years ago, the Danbury Family uh, Learning Board of Directors looked at what would a community impact look like here in Danbury. Um, many of us have been over the last couple of years attending the Norwalk Acts meeting um, in person and now virtually. And so we pulled together a group of folks back a year and a half ago, right at the start of COVID, to meet with Jennifer Barahona, who is their executive director, to really talk about, is this feasible in Danbury? What are the steps that we need to do to bring a collective impact to Danbury? And so um, we met with Jennifer Barahona, there was a couple funders on the line as well. And we talked about what it could look like in Danbury. Then COVID hit and we kind of slowed things down a little bit and um, you know, dealt with our immediate needs at that point. Um, since then, uh, just on August 10th, our board of directors met again and talked about, yes, we want to reaffirm the need for a collective impact in Danbury and it's time to get moving forward on this. So I, in my role as executive director of the Danbury Family Learning Center has reached out to two um, facilitators to start this. And so that's where we sit right now. We're hoping to have a meeting by the end of the month uh, where members of the community would, would be brought in um, probably close to 42 to 45 agencies coming together in Danbury would be invited to something like this. And we would go through a process of determining, A, what is the immediate need for our students in Danbury? What is our long-term growth needs for our students in Danbury? And then, then we would um, asset map what are the strengths of every organization to be able to offer programs and services um, to our families. And so what would be formed is um, buckets or cans as a true strive model. Um, they call them cans, um, community action network or plans. And so my 
suggestion and my board suggestion is that we start with two or three goals for the first couple of years, not try to grab everything from cradle to career and say, this is what we're going to do. It, it's just too much. So we need to look at what this immediate need is. And is it an early childhood? Is it a high school? Is there mental health? You know, what is the need? The community would do that. Um, the reason I reached out to um, uh, independent facilitator is I want to be able to be a thought partner as well as our board of directors. And I'm sure as well as many of you would like to be thought partners on this and to lead an organization and try to facilitate it um, and be that thought partner it just doesn't work. So that's why we would uh, reach out to an outside facilitator for this work. But certainly the work will support the work that we're doing in the district, that CARA's working, the Pathways Academy, there would be a whole communication piece in it. There's lots of pieces involved in a, in a community impact. And if I can just read um, to you, um, and some of these things I'm sure will resonate with you. Too many organizations are working in isolation from one another. That's what we're really good at doing with our silos in Danbury. So a collective impact brings people together in a structured way to achieve social change. Um, it starts with the common agenda, like I said, bringing people together, defining the problem and looking at shared visions to solve it. It also establishes shared measurements. Um, this is agreed upon and will be tracked over time for continuous improvement. To the next slide here. And then um, it fosters multi, um, mutually reinforcing activities. So that means coordinating collective efforts to maximize the end result and encourages communi uh, constant communication or continuous communication among all of us that are involved in building relationships and building trust within our community. Um, and then of course it has to have a strong backbone and a team that's de dedicated to orchestrating the work. And so those are the pieces that the Danbury Family Learning Center Board has looked at and what that would look like in Danbury. So um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be um, getting out invitations to you, but we wanted the community um, group to know first about it and the work that we're gonna be doing as we move forward. Be glad to take any questions. So, and I, I just wanted to add for the board, um, as we continue to investigate the idea of bringing a collective impact to the district, I know Ann had mentioned, um, you know, there are various non, um, <clears throat> various partners right here in Danbury, nonprofit partners here in Danbury. And so with all of the resources here in the district and the idea of, of, of being able to get everyone to the table, to have a cradle to career like a like focus, and so um, you know, working with Kenny Garden Readiness district wide with all of our nonprofit partners, um, you know, working on transition to high school with our nonprofit partners, um, work on transition into post secondary college and career with our nonprofit partners, um, and having everyone kind of all hands on deck to help support some of these initiatives. It could be chronic absenteeism. It could be infant health and development. It could be a number of these things um, that, you know, some things, most of these things we have the capacity to realize, but some of them are out of our control, infant health and development, kindergarten readiness. And so if we're all at the table to address some of these challenges together, we're more likely to have success. Um, I worked with, um, uh, in Waterbury with the Greater Waterbury Group uh, on their collective impact. There's another model in Stanford. There's another model in Norwalk. Um, some of our biggest cities have these models. Um, they've been very successful with it. They complement um, the, the district's respective um, uh, strategic plans and feel like it would be a great model for us to consider to bring to Danbury. So that's why Ann has continued to um, advocate for one, uh, but she also knows with advocating for one, it also is gonna require funding. Um, and those are some things she's also looking to secure as we move along in this process. I don't know if there are any questions. I know we had an initial discussion last year um, and has continued to work to try to drum up the financial support, but also the support to actually get this going for the district, um, knowing how important it could be to begin to get folks to the table and um, just try to drive success for the school district. Mr. Ginelli? Yeah, and 
and Kevin, so that is this information just information to this committee or are you looking for hands on help from people on a committee or other people on the board? It sounds to me as if this project is 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 more of a nonprofit coalition mm -hmm. as opposed to what some of the committee members here can do. So is this just an advice to us that this is a project you're looking to do? It's advice we're looking to do. We would definitely want and um, and hope that the board would also support support the um, support the endeavor. And then, of course, we would also want a board member um, as part of the team as well to represent the board. But it would definitely be a nonprofit like focus. Um, it, it would not be a district focus event, but but we're trying to spearhead it to try to get one going here at the ever. Gotcha. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions for uh, community uh, member? Sorry, committee members or non? Rachel. Thank you. I'm not um, on the committee, but thank you for taking uh, non-committee questions. And when you say board of directors, who do you mean? Can you just clarify. The board of directors that I'm referring to is the board of directors of the Danbury Family Learning Center, which is our District 501c3. And so we meet um, minimally four times a year, if not more. And that board has had a strong um, presence in looking at what community impact is and how that would best serve Danbury. And so okay. it's, it's well represented by uh, people from the community, from um, different nonprofits, from a state agency. And so they all feel uh, very passionate that it's time that Danbury move out of our silos and move into where we're really working um, together. And we bring, unite the community together to you know, look at what are the goals that we need to do here in Danbury. Um, and so everybody has a voice in that, uh, determining those pieces mm -hmm. as we move forward. So I, I encourage people to go into the Norwalk Acts. It's, it's you just type in AC, Norwalk and ACTS, you will be mesmerized. Now they're 13 years in to their initiative, but um, they have a shared dashboard that they share with the schools and they share with the community. Um, and just some of their figures and their um, successes of students, um, you know, um, cutting chronic absenteeism, having students engaged in things, programs that they're able to run, it's just amazing. And it's all because they've come together and said, here's the problem, here's how we need to solve it, here's how we can work together to make it happen. So it's really impressive. Thank you. And the need for funding is to um, implement some of those programs? So the collective impact backbone group doesn't necessarily run programs. They are the, it would be entail an executive director, a data person. Um, I look at like Norwalk Acts and they have a communications person, all of the for community, uh, community impacts now in Connecticut are part and have hired a policy director. Um, you know, could we be part of that? Absolutely, but the funding is for, to, would be to hire a director to, to really get this up and going um, after the facilitators um, have left and their, and their role is over. We do have a commitment from um, one funder in this area already, and I will be reaching out to a couple more that that funder will be going with me to to reach out for more funding. We're probably looking first year somewhere between six, sixty to eighty thousand dollars to get it up and going. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about um, how that those monies would be used? Is that you know, to pay for um, someone to hold a position as a coordinator, or is it to supplement some of the services? Or so. Yeah, right and, now I'm sorry, Ann. Can I just jump in? I, yeah, I just want to provide, and this this analogy may or may not be appropriate, but um, so if we can think about some of our nonprofits here in town, um, and so if we just want to, you know, go to one of our bigger ones and talk about the United Way. United Way, 
they get multiple groups to the table to help benefit the district to kind of serve as a liaison on many things. Um, and so our, if we have an executive director who's in charge of, you know, let's just say we call it Danbury Acts or Danbury Strive Together, whatever it might be, um, but we would need someone separate from the school district um, to lead the group. Um, and eventually, you know, the, uh, the collective impact would, would grow and we may need more support and greater capacity. Uh, but in the beginning, it would be to support the salary of a director to bring the various nonprofits to the table, including the school district, um, to address, you know, maybe the problem practice for the school community, uh, to make sure they're leveraging the many resources that Danbury has to offer um, to support our kids, you know, pre-K through pre-K pre through 12 and beyond. Um, and and it, it does require work, there's, there's just no doubt about it. Um, you know, and it, it becomes its own animal, quite frankly. Um, as we continue to just try to leverage this resources here in the district, I'm sorry, in the school community, uh, but it could be very beneficial as we, um, I'm going to put a couple of links to the uh, Stan, Stanford model and Norwalk model, and we'll also add them to the agenda for uh, the board to review um, at, at, at their leisure. But I'll start just by putting the links in the chat. Thanks, Mr. Walsh. Any other questions from board members? Yeah. Thank um, you, Dr. Neal. Yeah, Kate, just one other follow up. I would think that perhaps after the elections, you replay this or you redo this again, just in the case that people on the committees, particularly Amy and myself, are not going to be on the board. Rachel is up for re-election. So it may be something that the new committee members should be also uh, aware of something that's uh, you know in progress, so it doesn't sort of fall on deaf ears with this particular group of, of board members in this committee. You know, once you start making new committees, come December. Okay. Good suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Any other questions before we bring in our high school principal? Uh, just a quick question. And I think I attended one of the meetings with Ann uh, Gladys Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, uh, and I don't want to put a damper on anything, but I think that we have a lot of fires to put out. We have a lot of things that's going on. And I think at some point we, uh, you know, to revisit this, uh, we're talking about a, a, someone to bring in and pay someone to be an executive director, you know, uh, for this particular group. Um, right now, I can say uh, I, I heard the information. I'm just not comfortable saying that, yes, this is going to fit Dan Bear because I don't. I don't know all the ins and outs about it. So uh, that's just my two little cents worth. Yes, and Ms. Cooper, I, I think it would be good actually if we found some more time to continue to talk mm -hmm. about the benefits of the program. Last year, I believe in our community relations committee, uh, we had Norwalk Acts come mm -hmm. to representatives from Norwalk Acts come and make a presentation and um, given Ann's presentation this morning, it might be appropriate now to have him come back. Um, you know, now now that we're trying to jump into this a little bit more seriously, and, and and provide a little bit more detail and clarification about how we could possibly benefit uh, from bringing something like this to the community. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll be happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so. Um, we had only two agenda items um, to speak about this morning. Uh, the next one is bus transportation shortage um, and solutions. Um, and so I know um, we had invited uh, Principal Donovan to our first board meeting. Uh, we talked about um, our challenge and reality with um, the tents uh, being used for lunch. I think you also heard one of our students talk about the fact that uh, using a tent for lunch was one of the students' favorite things during lunchtime. Um, I 
talked to Dan and we've, I mean, we've been talking about this quite frankly since the summer, talking about different options and what this potentially or possibly could look like um, this school year, which is why we wanted to provide the update for the board. Um, certainly have not made any decisions, but we are continuing and, and, and a dialogue continues as we get um, deeper and deeper to the fall and uh, winter, winter, winter months approaching. Um, but there's also a bus shortage um, and we also need to also you know, identify some solutions to that as well. Um, when talking about the idea of um, releasing the tents, not having tents at all and um, eating in the classrooms, uh, when exploring those realities, um, it's turning out to be more challenging than it's, than quite frankly, it's worth. Um, and so th that's why I've updated the agenda. I wanna talk to you about some of the challenges that uh, we've discussed, revealed, um, that doesn't look like it's going to make sense for us. So I just wanna share a quick update on that first before we get into bus transportation shortage and solutions. Um, and that is um, the, I know I shared with the board, Dan and I shared with the board earlier, um, well, I shared with the board earlier, talked about the potential savings, number one, uh, with removing the tents. And however, the complications of having our students eat in classrooms, um, building wide, uh, the challenge of having kids without masks in classrooms across the building, uh, building wide. Um, and it's uh, just two of the challenges that is we're recognizing it's a greater challenge than we had anticipated, certainly a greater challenge that I had anticipated. And what I'm talking about Number one, the concern with having so many students in the classrooms with the mask off is a real concern for us as a, as a school community. One, um, two, cleaning up the building in multiple classrooms across the building uh, might be a greater challenge than that we can take on as a school community there too. Um, and so while we were processing and considering that option, um, there's another option, there's another solution that we also need to talk about. Um, Dan, um, has an update. Um, he's been exploring other ways we can feed students in the school, which include the cafeteria, but also um, a gym and possibly the auditorium if necessary. Um, so I'm going to ask him to speak to, to that reality and update. And then I wanted to talk about the bus transportation shortage and solutions. But Dan, I, I didn't want to, with you here the last time the board saw you, um, at least publicly anyway, um, we were talking about the tents and not feeding students in the cafeteria, but possibly the classrooms. So I just want to provide some context for everyone and just talk about what it would look like if we're feeding kids, cafeteria, gyms, et cetera. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, it, it's the better of two evils. You know, they're both, they're all not great plans. Um, each one has their pluses and minuses for it. You know, could we feed the kids in their classrooms yes but it, it becomes a big problem with as kevin mentioned clean up teachers with you know unmasked kids i think would be a problem getting that past teachers and, and things like that um you know the custodian costs and, and and things like it's a lot of classrooms to do even if we looked at bringing you know somewhere around 10 to 12 classrooms down to the cafeteria because we'd have to do that to provide some teachers blake breaks. Unfortunately, at this point, we are running about 40 overages, which means our population growth over the last month and a half has been pretty extreme. Um, we've had some people go out on, um, you know, maternity and injury and stuff. So we're running what we call overages, where a teacher teaches a sixth class. And it's starting to get really thin. Uh, so a lot of our teachers, why that impacts this is because a lot of our teachers now on that one day may have four classes straight in a row. And if they don't get any type of break whatsoever, um, that that's going to be a problem for the union. Um, so with all those things, we, we were still coming up with other solutions. You know, we've always talked about since the beginning of time, um, taking over the gyms. Well, here's the problem with that. We're talking about getting rid of the tents because of the cold. Well, guess what? Once we hit winter season, all of our sports come inside uh, and it's impossible to set up the main gym, for example, with probably close to about 250 to 300 desks and then take that down so that they can practice after school. We do believe we could get away with removing one of the smaller gyms, which would be the G gym. And if the board remembers back in the day when we were building that, 
Um, we talked about using it as a cafetorium, uh, you know, and, and having some meals served there. So it looks like we can do that with tables there and a kiosk. Uh, we're going through the numbers right now and looking at the sizes of the tables. Then tables you can fold up and put away. Desks we wouldn't be able to move. But the problem is the same thing in the cafeteria. If we remove the desks from the cafeteria, you know, I've asked uh, Superintendent Walston to maybe leave one of the tables for us because the kids really do, really do like going outside uh, and being covered. They really enjoy it. Uh, we go out and buy a couple of more of those blue round tables uh, that they like to sit at that allow, you know, five or six to be around them, depending on the size that we've purchased. We've purchased some that only fit four. Um, keeping one of the smaller tents in the courtyard so they can go out there and then bringing the tables back in. Now, the problem with bringing the tables back in, it allows more seating, but now we can't guarantee three feet distance from some uh, at all times. With the desks, we can because you can stay away. Um, so what we would do is we came up with a system of making QR codes for the tables uh, and they walk up to the table, student will scan a QR code for table 23 and that's how we can contact trace who was sitting next to who uh, on table 23. Is that a perfect system? By no means, but I believe between that and the other gym of taking a hundred or a hundred and something out, if we're at 800, 820 for a, our biggest lunch wave, it might be a little bit more now, we move a hundred out, uh, 150 down to the other gym and we would work out where they're going. Um, we could take the number in the cafeteria down and bring the tables back in and remove the desks. I think we can go with just serving normal lunches uh, as opposed to uh, doing it in the classroom. Not a great system for either one. I'm not happy about either one of them, but I just know it's going to get really cold out and heating those tents to me was the number one problem, not from a financial part, because that's Kevin, I really don't look at that part, but from a practicality safety, of and a safety, uh, safety, it's a, you know, you're putting, I guess, giant propane heaters in there uh, with a bunch of high school students, I don't think would go awesome. Uh, our kids are great, but it just takes one to have a problem tipped over, knocked over, just, just didn't seem good. And, and they're 40 by 100. I mean, that's a huge tent down there. Our two, two of our tents are 40 by 100 and 30 by 100. That's big. The other one's 30 by 70. I don't know how you heat that with the sides and all of those things. So right. you know, and, that's and kind of where we're going now. Right. And no, I was just right. going to say, Dan, it also requires a different level of supervision because the tents are not open anymore. And so right now we can see through all of the tents since you know we only need a couple of people perhaps standing to observe a whole bunch of kids. Once those drapes will fall, you know, we we need someone inside of it, or we need a couple of people probably inside of every one so you know as we continue to evaluate that one it was just getting costly and costly quite frankly and depending on how it also goes um we would look to open up the auditorium uh for students who may be a little anxious about being in there and you know um that's a little bit of problematic for us because it's more supervision more custodian but i understand some students may feel a certain way and parents may feel a certain way about kids eating unmasked uh possibly not three feet, definitely not six feet apart from each other. So we would look to open up that. So you could sign up to go there if you wanted to and contact Tracy there, another 150 students or so. Thank you, Dan. Um, are there any questions about that update before we go to bus transportation shortage and solutions? I think we just do it like Miss Spillane is doing. She is like, outside in the rain right now <laughs> she's eating outside somewhere i am and, and there's music on behind me i'll be really quick if i may so uh dan i don't so i'm kind of like not sure where we're at with this i mean you were talking about how great the tents were and maybe getting a couple more blue tables but then we get into the real cold and having heaters and that's a problem and another level of supervision i get it so what is the best what, what are you thinking I know there's a lot of, a lot of different challenges here, but are you thinking, am I hearing you say that it would be better to go into that G gym and have more waves or it sounded like being in the classrooms wasn't a good idea. It sounds like being in the tents with the heaters is not a good idea. Is that, so were you coming, was that your best 
um, option at this point is going to this one gym. Yeah, going to the one gym, trying to remove as many students out of the main cafeteria as we can. The, the reason for the, the other tent is even when it's 25 degrees out, there are some students who still go outside. They just love being outside. Even when it's raining, like you're out there, we can take your heaters that's behind you. We can use those. Um, but we, they are, um, you know, the problem is trying to fit the big number of, you know, 825. And if I could take 150 out of there, open up the auditorium, um, you know, for another hundred, then I'm at, you know, six something in the cafeteria with tables isn't the worst thing in the world. You know, we're used to 850 in the cafeteria because you figure some will go out, still, still sit outside. And by no means is any of this perfect. It's just that I'm been looking around at what other schools are doing, you know, anywhere down South, they're all outside, you know, and they can stay outside. It gets a little chilly down there, but you know, for us, I'm just preparing for the mass not wanting to be outside. Um, a lot will stay outside probably. They're outside right now in the rain. I can hear them. Um, but, you know, how do we get it so we can fit a number? I have to be able to fit a number at lunch. Where that number goes is, is completely up to the kids. But taking over that G gym, which has got the floor for it, we, when we built that, we built that floor for specifically for that. Seeing how many can fit down there, um, moving the lunch waves down there and doing not, not, we can't expand the lunch waves, the number of them, uh, because that block is already 120 minutes long minus 30 for lunch gives you 90 minus 16 for what we call homeroom, which is announcements and flex scheduling gives you the 74 minute block that everybody else has. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Any other okay. board members? Thank you, Mr. Donovan. No problem, thank you. So the last agenda item, um, at least for us anyway, bus transportation shortage and solutions. And so um, these last two, three weeks, we've continued to monitor uh, our bus transportation drop-offs in the morning, um, arrivals at schools, uh, dismissals from schools. Uh, certainly, our times have gotten better considerably over the last two, three weeks, uh, but we're still challenged a little bit. We'd still like to be a little bit better right now, given that it's um, October. Um, I am quite frankly concerned about the reality of uh, what testing is going to look like for busing, um, anticipating the same way we are anticipating for a possible reduction in force with um, certified and non-certified staff here in schools. I think we have to expect and plan for the same uh, with our buses and we're already dealing with the shortage. Um, and so as I'm continuing to try to find as many efficiencies as possible with our bus routes, um, I, I think I had shared with the board earlier in the school year, um, you know, the reality of we had kids, students who were dropped off at the high school at 645 once upon a time. Um, that changed to seven o'clock this year uh, because the challenges are right around supervision. Um, that change during the pandemic, uh, as a district, we didn't feel the impact of that change because we only had probably 50 or even less than 50% of our students attending school every day at the high school. Um, you know, that reality hit us hard when we first came back to open up school year this year, um, in addition to the increased traffic that we had the first couple of weeks of school. Um, I think that some of that traffic has been reduced a little bit um, and we are, uh, we've been able to find five more minutes for the high school. So instead of dropping off at seven o'clock, it's 6.55. Uh, but I, I, I think it's necessary for us to continue to try to find a couple more minutes space between the high school drop off and the high the middle school drop off, um, essentially resetting the district so that we can have, we're more likely to be on time for our K-5 schools as well. Uh, and so one of the uh, options we have talked about um, is within the school day, within the school schedule. Um, currently, Dan, are, is staff required at 7.05 or 7 o'clock? 7.05. Okay, at 7.05, um, instruction starts at 7.20. Uh, 
And so, you know, one of the things we talked about is moving up instructional start time to 715 or 710 at the high school and end in school five to 10 minutes earlier. Um, and then um, exploring the same idea where we would start the middle school time, possibly five minutes earlier and try to get 10 minutes back in the system and reset the bus routes. Um, hoping that all of our buses now would be a little bit earlier and reset as a system. So when we get to the elementary schools, everyone's on time. And then of course the same would be true for the afternoon. So we get our kids home on time. So parents are not waiting later. And as we get into the darker winter months, uh, we're more likely to be on time and we're not contending with um, not only inclement weather, but just gets darker outside earlier. Um, and so just, just wanted to share those thoughts, number one with the committee, um, given its potential impact on the community. Um, as we were exploring and having these conversations over these last couple of weeks, uh, we're trying to find solutions that were, are, are going to be less of an impact on families and parents and just trying to figure out what we can change within the system without impacting also our staff at the same time. And right now, these are, these are two solutions that we feel like we can shift, find great efficiencies with transportation, but not have too much of a significant impact on the school community. So we just wanted to share this for discussion. And Dan, I don't know if I left anything out there with the times in between, but if so, nope. please jump in. Uh, that's, that's about it. We would leave at 155 to get them to the middle schools a little bit earlier. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I got a question. Hey, Allie. Kevin, with the Proposals that, that you mentioned, is this something that you could move into just by making a decision as a superintendent, or do you need union approval for something like this? And we, we would definitely partner with the union on this. Um, you know, obviously any changes that we would make, um, we, would, we would not want it to impact on our staff negatively. Um, and, you know, our staff, like our families, also have um, family commitments and childcare challenges as well. Um, and so it would be important for me anyway, you know, it's one work from the required contracted time and then see if we can move the times up as much as possible without impacting that family childcare challenges that might exist with, for some of our family, for some of our teachers. Um, and so if Dan, as an example, Mr. J, um, if kids have to, I'm sorry, if staff has to be in at 705, and currently instruction starts at 720. If we can go to 7 feet, 715 or 710, and that gives the building enough time to get ready for instruction. And I think this is something we'll continue to talk to NEA about, but we did to start these discussions with them um, to answer your question more directly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Learner Amy, any questions about this? I don't have any questions about the buses, no. Nor do I, thanks. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Kate, I think, um, you know, for next year, we may have to consider something that's a little different, but this was a solution that we felt like now in October, as the school year has already started, um, the one that would have the, you know, the least amount of impact um, on families and staff. Um, you know, we may have to consider something a little bit different for next year. And, you know, we certainly have a little bit of time to plan for that. Hopefully the, the, the driver shortage will be a non-issue next year, but I, I don't know that to be true. Um, and I'd like to prepare accordingly one way or the other. Um, just out of curiosity, has SDA talked at all about um, sort of their organizational process through this whole thing? I don't know if they discussed anything with you about, you know, how if they're going to change hiring practices or or do anything differently. So I'll, I'll answer you this way, Kate. Um, one response I received is is as late as last week, um, is that they are anticipating the challenge around uh, vaccinations and testing. Um, although, and I, I was very happy to hear. Um, you know, many of our members are already vaccinated. Um, 
but they did send out a kind of a press release, not, not a press release, it was really an update uh, for their partner in districts. Um, and then this one was personalized to me. And just they just was sharing their overall concern with number one, their current status. And they just wanted all of us to be prepared just in case um, their drivers do not um, adhere to the weekly policy around testing um, that it could contribute to our shortage. Um, and now to answer you more directly about hiring practices, et cetera, we have not heard any updates. Um, you know, the, the partnership uh, with the state still remains and they have extended to, to, the, you know, to any way that they can help. Um, I haven't heard from STA yet if they have drivers um, in the motor vehicle being held up you know, with any paperwork process, because I was told if we can identify who those uh, people, those people might be, um, that the state would be willing to intervene to try to expedite, uh, but I have not gotten any names from them yet. Okay. Lauren, do you have a question? I do. Isn't STA just experiencing the whole problem everybody else in the country is having right now that just nobody's Lauren. coming out to go to work? So it's not just an STA specific problem. That's just correct. Nobody wants to come to work right now. That's, okay. Yes, that's, that's correct. Clarifying for STA. It's not unique. Yeah, it's not unique to Denver. Okay. Not like and, and they've fault. been a great partner. I, I don't want to okay. uh, suggest you. anything differently. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, any other questions from committee members? I do have a question when we move on from the buses, just so you're aware, Kate. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Um, Mrs. Cooper, Rachel, do either of you have a question for, for this topic? Okay. No, Lauren, did you wanna? Thank you. Oops, sorry, Gladys. No, I don't have a question. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Lauren, I'm not sure what your question is, if we should have uh, Mr. Walston continue or if it's tangentially related to any of the things that we have talked about so far. Well, I was hoping someone would have some solutions to the bus shortage, um, but if, <laughs> if, if there are no more um, conversation um, on a bus shortage, uh, transportation shortage and solutions um, and, and concerns, um, I will continue the conversation with not only Dan, but also the high school principals uh, back at the table with you know, some of our other bargaining units to just talk about the impact and see if there's anything we might be missing here before we move forward with some recommended time shifts. So we'll make sure we do our due diligence here. Uh, we did start a conversation with um, NEA and the high school last week, um, and we'll continue this discussion and um, make sure we have an informed decision um, we get as much information as possible before we make any recommendations for a decision. But we'll, time is of the essence, and we certainly recognize that. So we'll, we'll get moving on this. Thank you. So that's, a, that's it from us, um, Kate, in terms of the agenda items. Okay. Lauren, did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. So um, there was just a little bit of a um, question. Um, Amy, Rachel, and I were just wondering. Um, if you could just expand a little bit more on why we're pausing with the lead work um, work or job fair, rather. Sure, Sorry. sure, sure. No, not a problem at all. Um, so, so one, um, and just clarification on the job fair event. The job fair event is something that I initiated. Um, um, it was um, Jose Pimentel and Sandra Ferreira from LEAD. Um, we had our first meeting, I guess it was two weeks ago now. Um, and, uh, and quite frankly, I think we have a you know partner in the district that is um, has opened up their center and welcoming families from the Danbury community. Um, and, and quite frankly, given that we don't have our own family resource center in a downtown area, any, downtown area anymore, I think it's even more important uh, for, for our district to be partnered with LEAD, um, given, given their access and, and and, and how many families I understand anyway um, are going to them for support. And so they came by the office for the first time a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had a great talk about some of their ambitions uh, moving forward here in the Danbury community. Um, they've talked to us at that meeting, they shared, they talked to us about their parents' desire looking for work. Um, and um, Ann and I had was already 
um, in the works with, I believe it was Danbury Works for some type of job fair event. Um, and so I had said, well, maybe this could be an opportunity for us to do something internally. Um, you know, we still have a couple of vacancies here in town and um, Sandra, quite frankly, um, in very expedited way, um, had a um, paper and said, okay, well, let's, we'll, we'll get going on this. And um, they had put together um, a flyer for the event and we still had a lot of logistics to work through because we hadn't even talked about them yet. Um, but the idea was simple and that was, um, I would have an opportunity to have people from, uh, we have at, we have vacancies, um, we have a few safety advocate positions vacant, uh, some uh, para positions vacant, uh, bus drivers, I believe, was up there is vacant, although the district doesn't own it. Um, and so, you know, and then we have some teaching positions that are vacant. And frankly, Lauren, whether or not uh, we filled any of those vacancies, um, I saw it as an opportunity to get in front of parents, um, get in front of parents with um, officials from Danbury Public Schools, um, and make our families aware that Danbury Public Schools is a place in a space where that's going to be welcoming. Um, that's going to welcome you. When I say you, I mean our families who are applying for these jobs into the school district. Um, and we were, and quite frankly, we were looking forward to it. Uh, at the at the same time, you know, over, uh, I think, and I think that was, I forget what day we left. I believe I pushed the update to the board on Monday. I think I met with Lead on Friday, um, and I think I met with Lee the very next day on Tuesday. And um, I've been working with uh, Sandra now for the last three years in my short time here in the district. Um, and so it was, in my eyes, easier to be at the table with her. Um, Jose, I don't know very well, but I know Sandra pretty well professionally. Um, and so I've worked with her as part of the Nellie May grant, worked with her in her, in her role with Danbury Works, um, worked with her at various community events, worked with her in various community events uh, with the Nellie May grant. And uh, she was a partner with us in our strategic planning work. Um, and so very felt very comfortable working with her in this endeavor in her new capacity executive director. Um, but I thought it was premature of me to jump into a job fair event given um, over the last year or two, uh, frankly, some of, um, and I, I wanna make sure I say this the right way, but but just some of the challenges and some of the rhetoric that has come from there, um, uh, come from come from Leeds as an organization, their desire to get a charter school, and sometimes sometimes that language has been at at the um, has come by discredited in Danbury Public Schools, right? And so what what I wanted to do was try to have some time to strengthen our partnership before we publicly partner in this kind of joint job fair event. Um, I have, in, and so when, when we met with LEAD on Tuesday, they made Ann and I both aware um, that yes, they were still continuing to uh, focus on a charter school for the Danbury area, which you know um, certainly respect, respect their right to do so. Um, but they also shared that they're not looking to pursue the same type of charter that they were looking to pursue a state charter, which um, you know, my, my takeaway from that was they didn't feel like it would be as divisive as approach as perhaps you know, the local city charter would be. Um, I don't know what that means in terms of um, seeking that out. I, I don't know what that, what that looks like. So that clarification would need to come from them. Um, but they also explained that their focus is really gonna be more on community support, community advocacy, supporting families learning learning um, the English language um, and that you know the, that, that the center was really busy um, and that you know their focus would be shifting a bit. Um, and so I had asked if um, they would take some time to perhaps share any revisioning or re, you know reimagining um, that they might be moving forward with. I think it would be nice for them to share that with the school community. Um, and then our door would be open to continue to have an open dialogue uh, so that we can work on strengthening our, our partnership. Um, and I think whatever that strengthening looks like, we need to make sure we find an opportunity to make that strengthening aware to um, the school district so the school district sees it.
But the only thing right now our teachers and our staff and our families know about LEAD is that they're pursuing a charter. Um, and throughout that pursuit, it's been by discrediting their very public schools. Uh, and so I, quite frankly, I think my ambition got the best of me and my optimism got the best of me last week, uh, which is why I met with them immediately. And I have a great deal of respect uh, for Sandra. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been working with her for three years. Um, and I shared with, I shared, you know, those initial concerns uh, that I had, and I wanted to just pause right now, uh, but not pause on the idea of trying to work as partners, just pause on the event um, that I felt like was pre premature at this moment. Thank you so much for the clarification. Sure. Completely That's understood. You're welcome. Can I just add to that for just one, one quick second? Danbury Works is still an entity in Danbury that Danbury Public Schools is part of. And the executive committee for Danbury Works did decide that um, a hiring fair would be advantageous to all its partners in Danbury. And so working with um, uh, Chief Riddenhauer uh, to kind of mimic what we did with our pat party on the patio that we had several years ago, um, we are aiming to do a hiring fair with Danbury Works on October 27th from four to seven. And I'm just waiting for more of that information to come out. So the idea, you know, we still have of getting folks in um, and I'm sure LEAD will be asked to be part of that as well as all the other members of Danbury Works. Um, so the initial intent of getting that um, more folks into work in our schools you know, um, is still happening because we realize that's a critical factor at this point. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Yep. Any other questions from committee members? Rachel or Gladys, do you have questions? I think, Mr. Walston, if you have nothing else. Uh, no, that's it from us, Kate. Kate, it's nice to have an afternoon meeting. This is great. <laughs> Mixing it up, nice. Yeah, it is. Thank um, you. I'm I'll glad this worked out. Sorry. Yes, no, I agree. I'm just going to say I'm glad it worked out. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you all for taking time during the day to, to be here. I appreciate that. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn then. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Rich. And a second? Second. Thank you, Lauren. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.